Edmonton as COVID cases remain high in Toronto and Peel. We're going to be rolling in out, out announcements for regions that are affected. Long lineups at testing centres again today. Could pharmacies help make getting tested quicker and easier? Plus... It makes you feel worthless. She's worked on the front lines in a hospital since COVID-19 began. So why is she being asked to pay back the pandemic top-up she's been getting? And... That's pretty different. I don't like it. I don't like the vibes. How do you feel about wearing a mask all day? <laughs> it's back to class at Canada's largest school board. How did day one at the TDSB go? For a fifth straight day, Ontario is reporting more than 200 new cases of COVID-19. This means the province's coronavirus numbers are rising at their fastest rate in months. The hotspots remain the same. Toronto, Peel and Ottawa. Our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has more. As the COVID-19 case count trends upwards, people are flocking to assessment centres, whether in Toronto or Ottawa, worried their part of Ontario's surge in new infections. The latest numbers, uh, increase in numbers, have raised some concern. However, we are ready to deal with them. Here's Ontario's trend line of new cases since the pandemic began. The rate of increase right now, steeper than at any time since May. Final supplementary. So there are growing calls on the government to act. Why does the Premier have his head in the sand waiting for a second wave to hit? We need to be doing everything we can to minimize uh, the effects of a second wave. The government promises action, just we not today. We do have a comprehensive fall preparedness plan, which will be released very shortly. We're really urging everyone to do their part and to follow public health advice. For the second straight day, Premier Doug Ford is not in question period. He gave his daily briefing from Guelph and made a pit stop on the way. I thought I'd drop by and support Tim Hortons, the smile cookie. When will the government act to try to slow the growth in new cases? Just stay tuned. Over the next day or two, we're going to be rolling in out, out announcements for regions that are affected. More than 2,100 people have active cases of COVID-19 right now. More than 80% of them are in the GTA or Ottawa. Ford has spoken with the mayors of Ontario's three COVID hotspots, Brampton, Toronto and Ottawa. He says he's heard their concerns, but is so far not saying what specific measures the province has in mind. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. As Mike mentioned, lots of demand for testing today. You are looking at a bird's eye view of the snaking lineup for drive through COVID-19 testing at the William Osler Etobicoke General Hospital. Premier Ford had one word for this earlier this afternoon, ridiculous. Nearly 60,000 tests in Ontario have contributed to the last two days of provincial reporting. Chris Glover joins us live from a testing site at Toronto Western Hospital. Chris, what's the situation like there now? Hey, Joy. Well, I wish you were sitting down for this one because it might shock you, but I just talked to the guys at the front of this line. They said that they had been waiting for four hours. And this is the sort of scene that we're seeing at uh, testing centers across the GTA. Some people waiting in these lines just long enough to bail on them altogether. And we all know by this point that testing is a critical component in the fight against COVID-19. And so tonight, the Premier said that he is in talks with private companies to help alleviate these lines. For the second straight day, a multi-hour lineup at Women's College Hospital COVID testing center has caused this Toronto woman to leave. Still same line, so I think I will come tomorrow again earlier to see how it goes. Bailing on the lineup, but not the anxiety that she may be walking around with the virus. One of my friends, like from two other people that their friends got tested positive and I got a little bit nervous. She is far from alone. Nearly 60,000 coronavirus tests completed in Ontario contributed to the last two days of provincial case counts. And still, many stories are emerging of people ditching out. Over two hours now, I've been to three other clinics. The lineups were way, way longer than this, but this is still ridiculous. 
In London, an epic drive through testing line and hundreds of students were even turned away at an assessment center at Western University. We had some uh, trouble with staffing the center from about 8 until 10 a.m. in the morning. After a staffing snafu this morning, William Osler Health System's Etobicoke testing site is once again running at full capacity. We continue to try and optimize our processes so that we can swab as many uh, people that present as we can. Not good enough, says the Premier. I went by a, a drive through up by William Osler and it's ridiculous. It's three, three to four hours. Uh, we're on it. We did anticipate an increase in the lineups, but uh, perhaps not to this extent, and so we will be ready. We are boosting our capacity at assessment centres as well as our lab testing facilities. And calling in the private sector to help. The provincial government is negotiating with pharmacies to test people without symptoms. We have to make sure all the ducks are in a row, but making sure that the uh, say symptomatic tests through these pharmacies and uh, it'll take the burden off, off the other areas that have uh, potentially uh, a lot more ill people. In Toronto, the city has recommended the province extend hours at testing sites or introduce more mobile testing. There has been a, a lineup a problem, which is not good because people who feel they should get tested or need to get tested should get tested. Especially problematic when so much risky behavior still seems to be happening. I saw a lot of my friends, they got like Beach parties, boat parties. I'm like, ah, oh, be careful. A little prayer there for all of us to be careful and to, to be safe as well. And I just want to return back, Dwight, for one quick second to that potential deal between the provincial government and pharmacies. Ford said it is not 100% at this point, but he certainly seemed optimistic. And he even said that he had had a private phone conversation today with the CEO of Shoppers Drug Mart. And like you heard in Crawley's piece there with the fall pandemic plan, he's also saying that this plan could be announced within a day or two. So stay tuned on all fronts when it comes to the province's COVID plan. Four hours for those people behind you there, Chris. Way too long for something this important. Thank you, sir. Thank you. They are sights and sounds that have been missing in our city for six months, but today thousands of students could once again be seen and heard making their way to schools across our city. Ali Shiasan joins us live now from outside Clinton Street Junior Public. And Ali, it's been a first day back on like any other. That's for sure. And usually the first day of school is a good day, but those back to school jitters, those butterflies certainly hit different now that we have cases of COVID-19 affiliated with schools already. Good to see you, Romero. Did you get checked in already? Yeah. How are you feeling? You look good. So today it's uh, senior kindergartens, grade four and grade eights with the sort of staggered start. Today is about 100 students. Like most of the other smaller school boards last week, the Toronto District School Board is opening up in phases, starting with elementary schools. How do you feel about wearing a mask all day? Students are as ready as they can be. It's pretty different. I don't like it. I don't like the vibe. Everyone in masks, cohort circles telling them where to stand. Eighth grader Xavier Blake still found room for a little back to school humor. Is there a part of you excited to see your friends, see your teachers? Kind of excited to see some friends, you know, teachers. I don't know. I'm going to have to think on that one. <laughs> but right under the surface, the students' biggest fear. Catching corona at school. I don't, I don't know. It's like, it's like basically my home. Well, I'm nervous about catching the virus and spreading it to my siblings. Teachers have their own concerns. Yeah, I'm really nervous. <laughs> But um, they have a lot of really good uh, routines in place. I feel it's quite under control and uh, we'll see what happens. The fact that COVID-19 cases have consistently been in the triple digits lately looms over what would otherwise be a happy day. I'm praying for the best and we all don't know what's really going to happen, but we have to try. Uh, I'm kind of scared for my son, but he said he's good to go, so I hope so. 
So the latest data that we have tells us that there are at least 27 schools with cases of COVID-19 in Ontario affiliated with either staff or students. And that's mostly in the GTA, including schools in Halton Region, Durham, Peel and York and yes, Toronto. The latest update here, seven cases affiliated with the TDSB staff, though. No students. Dwight. Thank you, Ali. And we are looking for parents, teachers, and students who can help us cover issues surrounding back to school. We have a form on our website, cbc.ca slash Toronto, where you can share your concerns, tell us about school conditions and how classes are going. We will monitor the responses, follow up where we can, and take the issues you raise to the people in power. If working in a large hospital during a pandemic wasn't stressful enough, some University Health Network employees say they now have one more thing to worry about. 200 administrative assistants and physician secretaries recently learned they'll have to pay back the wage increase they were given. Angelina King explains why. It makes you feel worthless. This secretary says it feels like all the sacrifices she and her colleagues made going to work at a hospital during the pandemic aren't being acknowledged. CBC Toronto has agreed to withhold her identity and is calling her Erica for this story. That pandemic pay really meant a lot to us. It really said a lot for the work that we do and the sacrifices. It's our way of saying thank you. When the Premier announced pandemic pay in April, Erica and her department weren't included. But she was hopeful they'd be added because they are at the hospital each day putting themselves at risk. We trusted the hospital would look after it. But we're ecstatic when we got it. Everyone was so happy. And then to turn around and we just like we just can't can't put it into words like how devastating it's made it, it's a lot of money to us erica says while it's added financial stress for some it's not just about the money it's how we're valued the morale is low uhn says the workers were never supposed to receive pandemic pay because they aren't eligible under the provincial guidelines it's asking the 200 workers to pay it back, ranging in $100 to $1,500 a person. UHN apologized for the error and says workers have until the end of March to repay it. It also said leadership tried to influence the Ministry of Health to include all staff working at hospitals to get pandemic pay. Regrettably, a large number of employees have not been included. Questions to the ministry were directed to the Treasury Board Secretariat, which said, unfortunately, there's a limit to the amount of funding provided by the federal government and were not able to expand the program beyond the over 375,000 employees already deemed eligible. The 200 employees were given a deadline of September 9th to decide how they want to pay back that pandemic pay. But Erica says several of the employees have chosen not to respond. Not only do they want to keep the money, they still want their second installment. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. And remember, if you have a story you would like us to look into, just send us an email, torontotips at cbc.ca. Some residents in the northwest part of the city are on edge tonight after the recent murders of two men that police say may be connected. One of the killings happened outside a mosque on Rexdale Boulevard, and as Kelda Ewan reports, some of the people who pray there are now scared to return. Outside the mosque this afternoon, members of the congregation washing the pavement where just days ago, one of their own, 58-year-old Mohammed Aslim Zafis, was fatally stabbed. We are puzzled. We are lost. You know, we are searching for answers. Why? Why? The mosque remains closed today as members continue to grapple with the horror of what happened. President Omar Farouk says many are afraid to return. This incident has, uh, has uh, generated a great level of fear in them. You know, even my wife advised me that I should be very careful and cautious. About five kilometers away, another memorial. This one for Rampreet Singh. Police say Singh was homeless and had been living in this area under the Highway 27 bridge on and off since about April. A jogger I spoke with said he saw Singh regularly during his jogs and that he was often doing crossword puzzles right by the bridge. Singh was fatally stabbed while he was sleeping. Police believe it could be the same killer from the mosque stabbing, captured here 
on surveillance video. And they're warning people to be aware of their surroundings, especially those who frequent the path on the Humber Trail. It doesn't worry me, uh, but because I ride pretty fast. I've been walking around here for like over 20 years, so I'm not, I'm not worried. I think it's as safe as families are all the time with different parks. The school is here. It just, you know, there's always going to be that one off. Some workers at the nearby Etobicoke General Hospital, though, are worried, knowing the killer is still on the loose. They can be anywhere. They can be between anywhere among us, you know, so it is fearful. Emerjeet Parmar often took walks along the trail during her breaks. That's what we were discussing. We'll only walk here. We're not going back on the trail to walk because they said to be on the safe side, so we're not going to be walking in the trail anymore. Back at the mosque, Farouk says the main focus now is on comforting the congregation, especially Zafi's family. They're very much hurt and disturbed. Today I went with them to the cemetery uh, to make preparations for the funeral tomorrow. The funeral will take place outside the mosque at 11.30 tomorrow morning. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. Listen to this one. A call from a concerned citizen helped police track down a drunk driver swerving in and out of traffic. The most shocking thing, there was a small child in the car at the time. Um, I'm falling behind a car that has a child in it and they are very obviously drunk. Callers reporting that the vehicle has one small child in the car, turn left from the wrong lane. Hey, do you want to step out of the vehicle for us? It happened last Friday night along Young Street between East Gwillimbury and Newmarket. A 28-year-old woman from the town of Newmarket was charged with impaired driving. She was also charged for driving without a license. There were two other adults in the car along with a six-year-old child. Police say the child did not belong to the female driver. Smoke from massive fires that have been burning on the U.S. West Coast has reached all the way into Canada, and that's leading to some hazardous air for people in British Columbia. Certainly not going to be as poor of air quality as we've seen for the last four days, but it's going to drag on. We're not going to be totally out of the woods. The smoke is expected to begin moving out later in the week, but it's currently so bad that Canada Post suspended mail delivery across much of southern B.C., Parts of B.C., Alberta and the western U.S. have been seeing some of the worst air quality in the world because of the wildfires. And some of that smoke is now pushing all the way into the GTA. And Colette, you were speaking about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. it, is it having an impact on the air quality here for us? Yeah, and that's an excellent question. I know lots of folks have been wondering about this, Dwight. And luckily for us, it is not. And that's because it's high enough in the atmosphere that it's not affecting us. So those of us with res respiratory issues can kind of breathe, literally breathe a sigh of relief because it's the jet stream that's bringing us to this to us. So it's very, very high up in the atmosphere. Yeah, Vancouver's had a very unlucky claim to fame the last couple of days out of major cities. Their AQI, their air quality index, they've been at the top of the list for the worst in the world of major cities. And today they fell back into third. Seattle and Portland went back up to one and two. Now, just looking at a general satellite here, you're not really picking it up, but I'm going Going to give you an image this is just kind of to get the perspective I'm going to show you an image here I've grabbed this from Noah and it gives you kind of an enhanced imagery of what's going on so this has to do with smoke and an actual system so that's cloud cover and smoke but here it is here's Toronto there's Windsor so the lower Great Lakes in there this all this kind of haziness or milkiness that's actually not cloud cover that is just the smoke that's been making its way towards us so the sun sets tonight at 728 and again tonight you may see that kind of redness or orangeness to the sky, and that has to do with the smoke we're seeing in the atmosphere, but very, very high up. The jet stream's going to go a little more zonal. We've got a cold front that's going to come through tomorrow night, Dwight, and that's likely going to kind of kick this away from us so we won't be seeing as much of it. But it's kind of, it's uh, been causing our sky, our sunshine, the great sunshine that we've had to be just a little bit cluttered in terms of what we've been seeing of it. All right, we will check back with you for the forecast in a little bit. I'll be here. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
It's been a strange year in the world of sports, but particularly so far for our Toronto Blue Jays. When the Toronto, when the Canadian government rather denied their request to travel back and forth from the U.S., the Jays were forced to start their season without a home. Since then, they've settled into their minor league park in Buffalo, where they are. They made a huge push now for the playoffs. Rick Ross has more. The 2-2 two -two to Davis. And he gives it a ride to deep left. It'll be another year without October baseball in Toronto, but it's looking very much like a playoff year for the Blue Jays. Playoffs? We're talking about playoffs? Yeah, the Blue Jays are in a race for the playoffs. Incredible. And it really is incredible when you consider all of the obstacles this team has had to overcome. It started with an outbreak of COVID-19 in their training facility in Dunedin, Florida. They had issues crossing the border into Canada, which was closed because of the pandemic. And they were homeless to start the season when the Canadian government denied the team's request to travel back and forth to the U.S. for games. Two down. To think that you're going to play a Major League Baseball season without a real home. One of the things that we preached from the beginning, we we're not going to complain. We're just going to play. If we have to be on the road all the time, we're going to play on the road. We're underway at Salem Field. John the Jays were forced to play their home games in their minor league facility in Buffalo, Salem Field, which does not have all of the luxuries that Major League Baseball players are accustomed to. The weight room is in the concourse level next to the batting cages that are where the popcorn stand used to be. Every team that comes in here, everybody says it's fine, you know, so and, and we feel good. It feels like at home now. While they may be far from home, the Blue Jays have been welcomed with open arms in Buffalo. They are more popular than ever in Buffalo now, and that's evidenced by the numbers of people in Buffalo walking around wearing Blue Jays T-shirts, wearing Blue Jays hats. Uh, there's certainly a lot of support for the Blue Jays. Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown says fans there went so far as to try and get a glimpse of the team by stopping on exit ramps of highways near the stadium. People wanted to be a part of it. People wanted to try to see it. Unfortunately, that was not allowed. And I think people have settled into uh, the realization now that you can't see the games in person. The 3-2 pitch. Shanny got him. A realization that fans in Toronto have become all too familiar with. But that's not to say they won't be watching and cheering as this playoff run continues. It brings people together at a time we want to be apart, but it's also a rallying point. It's also something that's the water cooler conversation, and it's something that people can be excited about. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Our Raptors may be out of the playoffs, but head coach Nick Nurse isn't going anywhere after signing a new multi-year deal with the team today. Nurse was named NBA Coach of the Year this past season, his second year as head coach of the club. He's chalked up 111 wins and only 43 losses, leading our Raps. We were the number two seed in the Eastern Conference before being eliminated by the Boston Celtics in seven games. The details of the contract extension have not been released. For hundreds of thousands of Canadian kids, the coming fall and winter mean a return of minor hockey. But in the ongoing pandemic, there are serious concerns about keeping the game safe. Jamie Strachan shows us how one of the biggest hockey associations in the country is trying to achieve that. Hockey went off in March, and it's not like in September we're just going to turn that switch right back on. It's more like a dimmer. And as president of one of the largest hockey associations in Toronto, Susan Irving has spent a lot of time planning a return to the ice. I think everyone has to realize that, you know, there's going to be a lot of change with, ho with hockey, and change is difficult. For most, hockey won't start until October. And then, only for practice, it's unknown when games against other teams can start. Now, there's no one back on the ice playing hockey just yet, but let me give you a sense of what it's going to look like using this table hockey game. For starters, forget five-on-five five hockey. For most age groups, it's going to be four-on-four four or even three-on-three. Three. There'll be no face-offs, and there won't be three periods, but two longer ones. Each team will start a period with possession of the puck. Same for goals. No face-off. The scored-upon team will simply get the puck. There will be penalties, but no one will be sitting in the penalty box. Instead, a penalty shot. All of these things are part of the Greater Toronto Hockey League's return to play guidelines. The world's largest minor hockey league is cautiously stepping back on the ice. There's a lot of unknowns for us to be able to say we're going to be back for sure by this date. Um, 
I can say we want to we want to be back to traditional hockey as soon as we can, uh, but that that soon as it can as soon as it can will only be when it's safe. It's how provincial organizations across the country are moving forward. All plans a little different, but with the same goals. I think everyone is suffering a little bit from COVID fatigue. There, it's important for us not to take our foot off uh, off uh, off the brake here, and to ensure that we all put in the necessary protocols as in physical distancing. There are other changes as well. Players will mostly dress at home and no body contact allowed at any level. Changing the game in terms of physical contact is going to be really, really hard for kids because it's, it's just part of the game. Um, so we're going to really have to lean in on our coaches to really educate. And arenas will be eerily quiet. No parents huddled together cheering and yelling. Parents can still help do up skates but most provinces want only one spectator per player. All part of the slow process of restarting Canada's game. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. This pandemic has changed many things about our day-to-day -day lives, but it's also created a dependency on technology and how we use it. When lockdown started, we turned to a lot of these tools as emergency measures. It was like a band-aid and there was a huge learning curve for a lot of people. That learning curve for many was just learning how to use new software. We speak to tech columnist Ramona Pringle about how we've adapted and if she thinks this change is for good. That's next.
Since the pandemic started, we've all become a bit more reliant on technology, in some cases a lot more reliant, from online shopping to working from home to virtual yoga classes. More and more of what we do takes place in front of a screen. Six months in, tech columnist Ramona Pringle is reflecting on all that has changed. She joins us now. Ramona, I have done more online shopping in the past six months than all the past years put together. What are some of the biggest shifts you've seen over the last six months when it comes to how we now use technology? Well, I would say you are not alone. You know, you and everyone else, it's not just the way we shop, it's the way we work, the way we socialize. It's just become that much more pervasive and, and that much more essential. You know, for all of those things, as the, as the expression goes, there's an app for all of that. In fact, there's tons of apps for all of those things. Not surprisingly, we've seen um, social media usage go up, Netflix subscriptions go up, video games, people spending more time playing video games. Um, Amazon had an, a record-breaking year. As you say, people are shopping online more because they don't want to necessarily be going to stores, even once stores started to open. Um, it's really been interesting to see things like groups or apps that help neighborhoods uh, connect or, or local communities connect and see the growth in those areas as well. Oh, and of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention video conferencing. Yes. Who knew about Zoom <laughs> a year ago? And yet now it is, uh, you know, such a de facto part of so many of our lives and the way that we, you know, engage for work or socializing or so many of these things. One of the things that I think is really interesting to note is that up until this year, so much digital growth has been mobile. It's all been about apps. It's all been about our smartphones. Whereas what we've seen in terms of technology over the last six, seven months since the pandemic is uh, very much not a mobile experience because our lifestyles aren't mobile. We're home. And so, you know, why would you squint at a little screen if you don't have to? And this has had interesting implications. For example, podcast listening went down and that's a little surprising, but then you realize, you know, well, we listen to podcasts at the gym while we're commuting. And it really is, it's a mobile experience that is just not necessarily aligning with our lifestyles at the moment. Well, wow, you know, I didn't even think of that. And I think I am listening to less podcasts now. Do you think that these shifts now will last post-COVID? You know, I do. I do. It's so interesting. I think back to early March before there were widespread lockdowns. And I remember saying as more and more people started working remotely that this was a... a shift that I think once it happened, we we would really see it become a, a permanent transformation. One of the fascinating things that we're seeing, especially, you know, this is especially relevant to Toronto and Toronto listeners, is so many people have started realizing that if they're working remotely and connecting online for meetings, they don't necessarily have to live in the city. And so people have been eyeing more uh, pastoral places where maybe there's more value, maybe there's more green space, and, uh, and trying to connect from there. And of course, I think it's a bit of an identity crisis even for cities there's a lot to be contended with in terms of the value or the role or the allure of the city when you don't need to live there to work there so that's really fascinating but of course that brings us back to all the age-old challenges and questions around access and connectivity because for all those people who are opting to maybe look outside of the city they still have to be able to connect and access in this country is not uh, it's not equal everywhere yeah, the Wi-Fi wasn't great at the cottage in Prince Edward County this summer. It wasn't right. that. Great to have you back, Ramona. We will talk again. Thank you. Have a great week, Dwight. TIFF is on the way in our city, and tonight a documentary about Martin Luther King Jr. premieres. One day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. We'll bring you more from that movie and other civil rights stories that are being discussed at TIFF this year. That's coming up.
This summer, the city's parks and shelters have been overwhelmed by people experiencing homelessness. Today, Mayor John Tory announced that he wants to see 3,000 permanent spaces built in the next two years to deal with the crisis. The average cost to operate a shelter bed in Toronto was over $3,000 per month before COVID-19. Accommodating one person in permanent affordable supportive housing, on the other hand, such as say a studio apartment, can cost approximately $2,000 per month. It's all part of a larger 10-year plan called Housing TO. Some of the units will be pre-built modular homes, others will be rentals, and the city would provide supports for people living there, including mental health and substance abuse services. But in order for it to happen, the city needs help. Today's news conference was an urgent appeal for funding from both the provincial and federal governments. New real estate numbers out today show that in the late summer, housing sales in most of the country were red hot. This after an ice cold spring for Canadian home sales because of COVID-19. As Jacqueline Hansen reports, the new data seems to defy logic. Last month was the busiest August for home sales ever. That's right, in the middle of a pandemic, Canadian real estate has already made a complete comeback. If you had asked anyone a few months ago during, when this pandemic first began, where they thought sales might be. I don't think anyone had sales activity back at record levels, but here we are. It's partly due to pent up demand. COVID-19 lockdown measures came into effect right in the middle of the typically busy spring season and home sales dried up almost entirely. April was the worst month on record in more than 30 years. But it's clear with the latest numbers from the Canadian Real Estate Association, that chill was just temporary. Sales were up by 33% compared to last year, and average prices increased by nearly 20%. That's despite the fact that more than a million Canadians are still out of work and immigration levels have fallen sharply. The two traditional drivers of demand for housing, which is employment and population growth, are both very weak and yet we see demand at record levels. So it's, it's a bit counterintuitive. It's unclear to me that this can be sustained going forward. Rock bottom interest rates, federal financial aid and mortgage deferrals have likely added to the strength of the real estate market. How long the effects of all that will last is still very much unclear. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. The Ford government is continuing its court battle to prevent the Premier's mandate letters from being made public. I can't think of a reason why a government would want to do that. It's, it just strikes me as bizarre. Why are they being so determined not to let the public see what ministers are being asked to do in the name of the public? Late last month, the province lost its divisional court case to keep the letters secret. Mandate letters traditionally lay out the Premier's goals for each of his cabinet ministers at the start of their terms in office. Now, CBC News has requested the documents since 2018, but the government has refused to provide them, maintaining the letters are protected as cabinet records. The government is now headed to the Ontario Court of Appeal. It's also been ordered to pay the CBC $17,000 in legal costs. The Premier declined to comment on the case today, saying the matter is before the courts. The United States has dropped tariffs it imposed on Canadian aluminum last month. The decision came just as the Canadian government was about to impose retaliatory measures. The Deputy Prime Minister says that's still a possibility in the future. Should tariffs be reimposed on our aluminum exports in the future, Canada will retaliate with perfectly reciprocal dollar-for-dollar dollar tariffs. U.S. President Donald Trump announced in August that he'd bring back a 10% levy on Canadian aluminum. He had cited national security concerns at the time. Minister of Finance Christian Freeland says that common sense has prevailed. Millions of Americans along the U.S. Gulf Coast are bracing for a dangerous Category 1 hurricane. Hurricane Sally is not to be taken for granted. We are looking at record flooding, perhaps breaking historic levels. The slow-moving storm Sally is expected to dump as much as 75 centimeters of rain over parts of Alabama and Florida 
during the next 24 hours. Now, that's an average of four months' worth of rainfall in just one day. The entire region, from Florida to Louisiana, could also see life-threatening storm surges at 100 kilometer an hour winds. Hurricane Sally is expected to make landfall late tonight or in the early hours of Wednesday morning. The storm's slow pace is making its exact timing and path difficult to predict. And call it, they say it's moving so slow it could just hang over that area and just hours and hours and hours of nonstop rain. Here we go again. Yes, here we go again. And talk about moving so slowly. I mean, we mentioned this yesterday, and it's actually slowed down even further from its projections from where it was then. So this is a look at the satellite and the radar imagery here. And you can see how broad its scope is as well. So having an impact on Florida, the Florida panhandle here, all the way back through Mississippi and Louisiana. But as well, it's beginning to have that impact, too, on what's happening through Georgia and Alabama. So all these states being impacted here along the Gulf Coast. It is a hurricane. Uh, it is category one at this point with those winds of 130 kilometers an hour. But look at this movement north at three kilometers an hour. I mean, it's nearly stationary. And the other thing that's happening with this is there is actually a stationary front kind of laying here that's coming in just to the north. So that's almost going to be holding it in place. So often, you know, it comes in land and then it kind of takes its track towards the north and to the northeast. Well, this one, it's likely going to be there for a while. So just so many problems associated with this storm. Okay, let's bring it back home to us to the Great Lakes region. And this is what we're looking at with our current temperatures. That forest fire smoke that I was talking about earlier, yes, it'll likely uh, have an impact on the sunset that we'll see tonight at 728. So you may want to check that out, but also an, a little impact, just a little one on our temperatures today. So we probably lost a degree or so in terms of our daytime high just because of that a little bit of extra milkiness, a little haze up there with that smoke high up in the atmosphere. And again, not impacting our air quality because it is so high up there with the jet stream bringing it in. Our current temperature then sitting at 18 might be at 19 if it weren't for that. And uh, we've got rain well to the north of us. Otherwise, high pressure is still in place. So generally, it will be clearer skies overnight tonight. And what we're looking at is it'll be late tomorrow that we're going to see a front come through. In the meantime, a strong southwesterly flow is actually going to be pushing our temperature up so that we're going to have the warmest day of the week tomorrow. This is how late. After 9 o'clock, some light showers will come through, a little cloud cover, but probably gone by morning the next day so that we'll have the sun come back at us, but it's going to bring in some cooler air. So the warmest day tomorrow, then cooler air, and by the time we get to the end of the week and the weekend, some very chilly nights, but tonight not nearly as cool. Last night we went to 6.3, our low at Pearson. These are our lows tonight way better and tomorrow afternoon way better in terms of those daytime highs it's going to feel pretty good in fact that's what i mean though by thursday some cooler readings and this is what i mean by some of those overnight lows that's going to be a chilly one saturday night into sunday if you have plans to get out do some walking hiking whatever you're thinking for sunday morning this weekend dwight that's going to be a little bit crisp that one yeah, i got to start searching for the sweaters tonight. Thank you, Carla. Yeah, but look at it. At least it's going to be sunny and dry. Just in the evenings. We're oh. good in the day. Wow, 26 <laughs> on Wednesday, and then it's downhill from there. Thank yeah. you, Carla. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>
The city of Louisville, Kentucky will pay $12 million to Breonna Taylor's family to settle a civil lawsuit over a botched police raid. The 26-year-old black woman was fatally shot by police who burst into her apartment at night on March 13th. While her death was a tragedy for so many, let's remember that Brianna was first a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, a niece, a girlfriend, a friend, and a co-worker. The city's wrongful death lawsuit settlement includes a list of police reforms, including how search warrants are handled. During the late night raid in March, police had used the so-called no-knock warrant, which didn't require they announce themselves. None of the three officers have been criminally charged, but Kentucky's attorney general is investigating the incident. The suspect who police had been looking for that night was arrested the same day at a different location about 16 kilometers away from her apartment. Taylor's death, along with George Floyd's in May, sparked months of protests over racial issues and police-involved killings. The Toronto International Film Festival is shining a light on movies with a message, specifically films about social, political and economic, ch economic challenges for underrepresented communities. One of them is a new documentary about Martin Luther King Jr., which debuts today. Yelena Adzik has more. Premiering today at TIFF, a fresh documentary on Martin Luther King Jr. based on newly declassified files. MLK FBI quickly dives into archival footage, starting with this famous speech. One day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Drawing on the work of historian David Garrow, the film re-examines the FBI's motives and methods in their attempts to undermine and discredit the iconic civil rights leader. The second person in the FBI may have been Sullivan sends an urgent memo in which he says, after the March on Washington, it's clear that Martin Luther King Jr. is the most dangerous Negro in America. Now, based on other films as well as bios, it was already known that Martin Luther King Jr. was wiretapped and blackmailed because the FBI saw his power with the people as a threat. Now, it does help, though, that we have Sam Pollard on as the director. He was actually an editor. He worked on Spike Lee's films, Mo Better Blues, as well as Clockers in the 90s. And it shows here because his editing and cuts decision-making is masterful. So the film really does serve as an urgent reminder of the necessity of vigilance in the age of increased surveillance and attacks on the rights to free speech and protest. The doc MLK FBI premieres today at the film festival and audiences across the country are able to purchase tickets to view the stream starting at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Now that's also around that time that TIFF organizers will make available via YouTube a special talk recently held by film director Ava DuVernay. It's a passionate kind of talk. She's a champion of human rights and especially justice for black people. And her insights underscore the reality that docs like MLK, FBI are as relevant today as ever. Yelena Adzik, CBC News, Toronto. It's been a sunny week through clouds here and there, but it's about to get even warmer tomorrow. Colette will join us after the break with the details on that. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Ismaila Alpha, host of Metro Morning. On tomorrow's program, I take you to Jane Finch, where I meet a young man who shows me what he feels are the most important parts of his neighborhood and says he wouldn't be the man he is without his community. Join me weekdays, 5.30 till 8.30 for Metro Morning on CBC Radio 1.
The second annual Hero Truck Pull took place at Downsview Park today. GTA Charities went head to head to see who could pull a 20,000 pound truck 100 feet the fastest. Each team raised funds towards their own causes and awareness of the important work that they do. But of course, before such a challenging task, you need to pump up. We're here today uh, on this incredible day bringing Second Harvest's truck pull again. And through these organizations, Daily Food Bank, Feed a Ford, and, um, and Second Harvest, we're pulling to victory. During COVID, all of these great organizations pulled together to make sure that we could get good food to people. And we have way more work to do. So this was just one fun way for us all to fundraise a bit and pull together once again. On your mark. Alright, that feels Woo! good. So what was your time? 15.74, a second harvest record. Yeah. I think we have a great team. Everyone worked really hard and I'm very proud of this group. Yeah. And I think we put some good thought in terms of where everyone was uh, stationed throughout the poll and uh, I think the results show for themselves. It was amazing. It feels pretty good to be pulling our trucks. Yeah. They do so much hard work all day every day. Give them a little break and raise some money. This is a chance for us to let off some steam during a, a last six months that have been so hectic with service increases and uh, extra workload on our staff teams. The work that we put into this is far less than the stress and the work that the people that we serve uh, go through every single day. So it's a, it's a minor piece for us to give so much back. And we applaud your efforts. Great mm -hmm. job on everybody awesome. up there. <laughs> All right, what is awesome? What's also awesome, I should say, the weather tomorrow. Yeah, the weather's pulling its weight. Let me tell you, <laughs> we're going in a good direction here. Overnight tonight, much milder than last night, uh, down to that 6.3, and here we go tonight, 15. You can't argue with that. So uh, it's going to feel pretty good tomorrow morning and uh, to get you going. How about 26 by tomorrow afternoon? Lots of sunshine. It's going to be late day before we have those clouds kind of rolling in as the front's going to be approaching. So those winds will be a little bit breezy from the southwest, and once that front does go through, it is going to change things up a little bit. You knew that was is going to have to happen. So some showers uh, late, late evening into the overnight. Some of that cloud cover, it will be receding into the day Thursday and we'll come back to sunshine again. But then you see what the temperatures do. So they'll be down below seasonal. We go above tomorrow and then they're going to be below seasonal as we go into the end of the week. And it's not just that. You're going to be noticing much more than that these overnight lows because they're going to be taking such a dip too. So Thursday night into Friday morning, it's six. And then Friday into Saturday, it's five and they keep going down so we're getting closer to some record territory with some of these overnight lows and into the weekend they are going to be pretty much on the chilly side there but what's nice is high pressure comes right back to us and a lot of sunshine some dry conditions so really we are going to have some very nice weather it is just a little bit crisp for us coming up we'll take it we can handle it thank you Colin. Yes, that's our can. show for tonight thank you for joining us we'll see you back here tomorrow at six everybody